when I came in this morning, I thought I might be at the wrong conference because it all seemed to be about science. But and I was told to talk about ethics and morality. So that's. Um, but I, it's quite nice to have uh, some different perspectives, actually. And and I'll be talking about morality and how it's connected with religion. How ethics and religion fit together, or if you like, whether there's any connection between the domains of morality and ethics and the domain of religion. Now, for much of our history, the two have seemed very closely connected. Um, and in the 19th century, when religion started to be seriously under attack, people worried about whether morality might collapse um, without its religious support. Um, many of you may have read the brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky, where he has Ivan Karamazov saying, um, if God is dead, then everything is permitted, or words to that effect, depending on the translation. Now, that perhaps seems a bit oversimplified. Obviously, people who don't believe in God don't necessarily abandon all moral boundaries. Um, nevertheless, actually, for what it's worth, I'll just mention this in passing, recent empirical research has come up with some striking results. A study published in 2010 in North America established that regular attenders at church or synagogue are more likely to give money to charity, more likely to do voluntary work for a charity, irrespective of whether that charity is religious or secular, more likely to give money to a homeless person, uh, more likely to give excess change back to a shop assistant, to donate blood, to help a neighbor with their shopping, spend time with someone who's depressed, allow another driver to cut in in front of them, and uh, to offer a seat to a stranger. Um, well, having mentioned that, there's obviously no direct causal link. I mean, clearly, there are many highly moral and admirable atheists, and conversely, unfortunately, there are clearly many corrupt and dubious people who are religious or claim to be religious. Um, but I shan't pursue these statistical or causal questions today. Instead, I want to look at a more abstract uh, well, a more philosophical question, let's say, because I don't actually think philosophical questions are purely abstract. I don't think they actually connect with things that are of vital concern to all of us. But perhaps a slightly more theoretical question. Namely, what is the basis of morality? What supports it? What validates it? Now, um, in the past, morality is has been often thought to have some kind of religious basis. Goodness and rightness come from God. But could there be some alternative basis, something non-religious that still gives an objective basis or grounding for morality? Well, I'll just consider a number of alternatives. That's really all I want to do this morning. Um, uh, this moves on straight away to two, subjectivism, uh, item two on the, on the list there. Um, now, one position you could take is, that, is a very radical one. You could say, well, look, we don't need an objective basis for morality because there isn't one. Morality is just a matter of subjective, purely subjective taste or preference. Let's call that the subjectivist view. Um, that was very popular when I was a, a student. When I was an undergraduate, uh, and generally I think in philosophy in the kind of 60s and 70s, there were, we, things were still to some extent under the shadow of a doctrine called logical positivism, which uh, dismissed everything that couldn't be checked scientifically or verified as meaningless. And in those days, many people were subjectivists. They said, oh, morality is just a matter of your personal preference. And we were taught to say, oh, that's just a value judgment, in a kind of rather supercilious tone of voice, meaning, oh, that's just your personal preference. It doesn't have any objective 
basis. Um, now, in philosophy, there's been a remark quite an interesting shift since those days. Um, there still are subjectivists around. In fact, there's some very sophisticated ones uh, nowadays generally called projectivists who think that morality is just a projection of your own tastes or uh, emotions or passions. But the majority view has shifted. The majority view seems to be now that some kind of objectivism in ethics is correct. Um, there have turned out to be rather serious problems with subjectivism, uh, particularly the view that moral judgments are just like grunts uh, of approval or disapproval. You know, uh, 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 uh. Um, now that kind of view ran into problems um, because when we're discussing actual moral issues, euthanasia, uh, capital punishment, whatever issue you might be interested in, we tend to produce evidence, reasons, arguments. We don't just grunt at each other. We may partly do that, but not only that. Um, we try to come to a rational decision. Now, of course, that could all be an illusion. We could be kidding ourselves. But at least it seems as if it's morality is a subject where we try seriously to arrive at the right answer um, using reasons, argument, evidence, logic. Um, and that at least is sort of prima facie, an initial support for objectivism, or at least it kind of casts doubt on the crude subjectivist view. As I've said, there still are many um, respectable subjectivists around. Simon Blackburn in Cambridge is one example who's produced quite a sophisticated form of projectivism that morality is just a projection of your personal emotions, passions and preferences. But it's becoming a minority view for what that's worth. Let me move on to number three, Darwin, which I call Darwinian style or Darwin style naturalism. Um, now, even if you, supposing you reject kind of crude subjectivism, that morality is just grunts of approval and disapproval, you could still get, maintain that in the end, moral judgments are just a function of the kinds of inclinations and drives that you or the human race in general, or our society in general, human race in general, has evolved to have. Um, maybe they're widely shared preferences, but in the end, they have no more objective backing than the way we happen to have evolved over the millennia. So if our history and if our evolution had been slightly different, then we'd have different moral beliefs. So in, on that kind of view, perhaps supported by a Darwinistic conception of ethics, it's all contingent. Morality is very fluid, contingent. It depends on the flux, the vicissitudes of our historical and evolutionary development. Um, now, many of those sorts of ideas about morality are strongly influenced by Charles Darwin. Um, and in his Descent of Man, uh, Darwin's Descent of Man, published, published in the 1870s, um, very interesting book. Uh, if you look at chapters four and five of that book, which are very readable and very interesting, he puts forward what you could call a reductionist attitude to morality kind of cutting it down to size. As, so morality doesn't give us insight into eternal values or ultimate uh, goodness or rightness. It's just a product, or, or if you like, a byproduct, on Dar this is Darwin's view, of how our ancestors happened 
to have evolved in the struggle for survival. Um, and in that book, The Descent of Man, Darwin drops a highly significant phrase, I think. He talks about the so-called moral sense. And the so-called, a slight sort of sneer there, perhaps, or a slightly skeptical tone. Um, so he, I, I think he is pre- put, putting forward a reductionist approach. Conscience, the so-called higher impulses that many philosophers and, and uh, theologians had gone on about, um, are really just one or more of a set of natural feelings that have developed under selection pressure, struggle for survival. And Darwin actually mentions altruism, unselfishness, looking after your mates, your comrades. He says that if you think of a tribe where there is a lot of that, it's likely to do better in battle than a tribe where people, just everyone looks out for themselves. So Darwin says the tribe where there is unselfishness where people help their comrades in a war or a battle is likely to be victorious over other tribes and he he goes on and that would be natural selection. So unselfishness is as it were selected for in the grim struggle for survival on on Darwin's view. Um, Well the crucial point he's making here is that it is really about the purely natural contingent Uh, origin of our moral feelings. They're really, our moral feelings aren't anything sort of uh, with a halo around them. They're just like any other drives we happen to have inherited. Um, And in fact, they're really, there's no difference in kind between our own impulses and those of the other primates. Um, They're different in degree, Darwin says, but not in kind. I mean, that's obviously consistent with Darwin's general view that we're not really different in kind from the animal kingdom. Um, Now, that may be perfectly, well, maybe a lot of truth in that, but but I'm really trying to think about what that implies for morality. Um, So, what about this classic Darwinian position about morals? It's, It's a bold position, and it's clearly been very influential. But I think there's serious problems to it. So to talk about some of those problems, we we'll come on to f- section four and talk about four features of moral value, which I think are important and which don't quite get explained, or perhaps they just get denied, on a radical naturalist view, radical Darwinistic view. First of all, moral values are, or certainly seem to be, objective. They don't seem to be a function of my personal preferences and desires, or even the preferences of society in general, or the human race in general. Cruelty, arrogance, these are wrong. At least a lot of people want to say they're wrong, objectively wrong. (coughs) And remain so, the wrongness doesn't seem to depend on whether I like them or I have a preference for them. Even if I start developing a preference for cruelty, it doesn't become right, does it? It just means that I've become corrupt. Supposing we all, everyone in this room, starts developing a preference for being cruel, that still doesn't make it. Supposing the whole human race or the whole, every inhabitant of the UK, or the whole human race, however wide you make it, starts being rather attracted by being cruel and arrogant. Supposing the Nazis had won the Second World War and they'd uh, brainwashed or exterminated everyone who didn't agree with them about the superiority of the strong and the master race would those views then become right? Well, no. It seems we don't want to say that. It would just mean that the human race had become corrupt, something that unfortunately is always a serious possibility. Um, So that's objectivity. Universality. Uh, Moral values seem to be universal. 
I mean, not in the sense that everyone, everywhere, in all times of history, always accepts them. Um, I mean, obviously, conceptions of virtue vary from culture to culture uh, and from place to place, something Darwin goes on about a lot. But that when you think about it, that doesn't go against their universality. Um, the wrongness of slavery, for example, the goodness of compassion, these things seem to be universally true there, as it were, irrespective of whether they're actually accepted everywhere. They have a kind of universal validity, seems to me. Now, it, if you, you might think, oh, surely the fact that they vary, that not everyone acknowledges them, that must show they're subjective. Or the fact that not every culture values um, forgiveness. Doesn't, that, doesn't show it's, that must show it's not universal. But when you think about it, scientific truths are like that too. Not everyone accepts them. They haven't always been recognized in all times and places. But we still think they're universal the rules of the laws of physics. Um, we think they apply always and everywhere. So morality could still be like that. So even though not accepted everywhere, the principles of morality could still be universal. I see a few people are looking skeptical. We'll maybe talk about that in questions. So that's universality. We've got objectivity, universality. Thirdly, necessity, which is similar in a way. Um, cruelty, does that just happen to be wrong? happened to be wrong in Western Europe or in the 21st century? Or does it have to be wrong? I think the second. It, it, it has a necessity about it. It must be wrong. It's wrong, as some logicians say, in all possible worlds. In every imaginable world you can think of, in every logically possible world, cruelty would be wrong. And that doesn't, of course, mean that people aren't cruel, um, we often, unfortunately, break and violate moral values because, you know, we're weak and uh, often um, bad lot. Uh, this is sort of human beings. We're not a very um, um, well-behaved species a lot of the time. Uh, nonetheless, these principles, moral principles, seem to retain their necessary force the, the German philosopher or logician, mathematician, Gottlob Frege, F-R-E-G-E, -E, um, said he was talking about mathematics and logic, but I think the same probably applies to morality. He said, these principles are like boundary stones which our thought can overflow but not dislodge. So you, you, you can sort of transgress them, but you can't shift them. So the wrongness of cruelty is like that. You can frequently violate it and transgress it, but you can't shift it. It remains necessarily wrong. So that's necessity. And finally, um, what...